guest here on stage, and I wish I could read his mind the whole day, because he's a, a very interesting person um, with an interesting biography. I, I, I need really, I need my paper to not forget uh, some very important points about Kaiser Kuo. And uh, Kaiser Kuo is uh, uh, ursprünglich uh, von chinesischen Eltern in den Vereinigten Staaten geboren und aufgewachsen und hat sich schon sehr früh als Brückenbilder zwischen den beiden Welten verstanden. Er ist dann auch nach China. Er hat dort eine Heavy-Metal-Band ähm, geleitet und ich glaube Bass gespielt, äh, ACDC äh, Musik gemacht. Und dann ähm, war er Chef der Kommunikation der internationalen Kommunikation der Suchmaschine Baidu. Er hat als Kolumnist für den Beijinger geschrieben und dann hat er 2010 mit einem Kollegen den Sinica Podcast in Peking gegründet, wo er prominente chinesische Journalisten und Beobachter von China interviewte. Und 2016 wurde Sinica vom New Yorker Startup SubChina übernommen und so kehrte Kaiser Kuo mit seiner Familie zurück nach New York, wo er heute noch arbeitet. Und wir sind sehr, sehr froh, dass er hier ist und uns seine Impressionen gibt zu both of the world. Both. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you to be here. Um, the Kaiser. The Kaiser in your name, the Emperor. Uh -huh. <laughs> Where is this coming from? This is actually a, a bad effort at a bilingual pun that my father said. My father's name is Guo Jing Kai, so the main part of his name is Kai. And so in Chinese, the word for son is R. So it's Kai apostrophe S, R, Kai's, R, R, the son of Kai. Ah, that's nice. Yeah. What yeah, a nice it's, coincidence. it's embarrassing. I mean, this is the first time that I've talked about this publicly, so. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You Thank put you. me on the spot. Thank I want to say, first of all, you did such a marvelous job handling that situation this morning. And Thank I you. I, I think that was incredibly professional. Yeah. Thank you. It was truly, truly respectful, and you are to be commended for that. Thank you very much, Kaiser Kuo. What a, what a fascinating day it's been. <laughs> uh, it's really been interesting watching the reaction of people really around the world, uh, those paying attention anyway, to, you know, as they reckon with, with the tectonic shifts that are underway right now in China. Not surprisingly for some people, it has done nothing more than just amplify preconceived notions. The people who are habitual cheerleaders for Beijing act as though it's already a foregone conclusion that China will successfully transform its economy into the vision that Xi Jinping has outlined. Uh, uncritical cheerleaders have also you know, insisted this is just going to show up the Americans at last. Uh, they imagine that it's maybe putting Beijing back on some notional correct path towards socialism. Um, opposite them, of course, are people who see in Beijing's latest moves nothing but a belated recognition of some fatal flaws in China's political economy, uh, pathologies that they believe are too far advanced now for Xi Jinping to possibly treat successfully. Uh, and they decry the heavy handedness of what they believe is, you know, is Xi's desperate efforts to stave off a collapse that they believe is long overdue and probably richly deserved. Still others in the US, including people from the progressive left all the way to the reactionary right, have spoken admiringly, even maybe enviously, of that same heavy handedness and wish that the US could claim such decisive leadership. Uh, as it is increasingly the case with all things China, this latest chapter has taken on the quality of a Rorschach test where really people in it see what they want to see and it says much more about the observer than it really does about the observed. Still, it's very early in the course of things, so early that just a couple of months ago, I was still involved in a lot of conversations as to whether this disparate set of regulatory moves that, and, and, and tightenings here and there, uh, that whether that amounted to anything cohesive, whether there was something unified about this, uh, after all, I mean, it has embraced everything from renewable energy to real estate, from education to, uh, to you know, entertainment, from curbing the power of big tech companies to pursuing more equitable distribution of, of income. So there's a lot uh, to be under an umbrella. But as one friend of mine put it recently, now that Xi Jinping has really tied it all up nicely in a bow, 
I think we can talk about it as a, a unified idea. Um, not long ago in October, the magazine Chu Shi, which is a leading party organ, uh, they published a speech that had been given in August to Bai Xi Jinping, where he did talk about all these disparate items as one kind of cohesive whole. Uh, and then, of course, just last week, the third historical resolution uh, was, was published, and we all got a chance to look at it. This is something that came out of the sixth plenary session of the 19th Party Congress. And from its mixture of critique and praise for what had come before, uh, you know, before Xi Jinping, there was, uh, it was clear that Xi really does intend to shift focus from this decades-long fixation with high-speed growth, with GDP uber alles, into something very different, into high-quality growth. No longer will, you know, uh, it be all about making a bigger pie. Now it's going to be about making a healthier uh, maybe uh, more evenly divided pie, uh, as, as they've talked about. So what will this new focus on quality growth actually entail? Well, obviously, there's going to be a greater emphasis on innovation and on basic scientific research, putting more emphasis on the R and less in the D in R&D. The technologies of the so-called fourth industrial revolution, artificial intelligence and advanced uh, robotics and, of course, quantum computing, uh, bioengineering, lots of, of gene splicing technologies. Uh, Beijing also clearly wants to wean itself off of dependence on key uh, technologies that are currently controlled by the U.S. and its close allies. Technologies, of course, like advanced semiconductors that, that, that Gideon Rockman was just talking about. So what do we call this new chapter in, in China's history. Chinese state media have started talking about a new journey, uh, while others have used the old phrase new era or common prosperity, which really is just sort of a piece of this. Uh, at Sub China, the media outlet where I, I, I work, our name for it is the Red New Deal. It, after all, it's hard not to notice certain pretty strong parallels to Joe Biden's uh, Build Back Better program, which of course draws much of its inspiration from the, the progressive wing of the Democratic Party's Green New Deal. So our Red New Deal contrasts with that. But both leaders hope to lay a foundation for a post-fossil economy, a post-carbon economy, creating hopefully millions of new jobs in clean tech. Uh, each hopes to take the lead in the technologies that elites of both countries recognize are going to define our future. Uh, to prevent the kind of unequal distribution that we saw with the last great disruptive wave of globalization. And uh, both countries really want to try to restore the dignity of the manufacturing sector, in the case of the United States, to build a damn manufacturing sector where there isn't one. Uh, both countries want to really, they, they both laid out bold plans to put their economies on an entirely new footing. It's hard not to see this. The two superpowers are taking markedly different approaches, though. I think it's important to see the U.S., of course, has used stimulus quite liberally over the course of the pandemic and has just passed this $2 trillion infrastructure package. Uh, it's focused very much, of course, on, on just, not just infrastructure, but other things. China opened the taps back in 2008 and 2009 in response to the great financial crisis, but it has been quite careful about using stimulus uh, in response to COVID-19. It's, it's, it's interesting. Um, and, you know, look, pronounce, it, it, it's, uh, you know, they seem to be determined to push through this whole package of change on not much more than the strength of old sort of almost Maoist style campaigns, uh, moral suasion uh, and, and grit and determination. If we look at pronouncements from the party uh, about, about uh, you know, this resolve to address major imbalances in the Chinese economy, uh, and, and you know, this is part of this push for quality growth, uh, it, it's, it's, it's clearly eager to take the air out of some massive asset bubbles, especially in real estate, including this bloated uh, speculation, which has fueled uh, you know, a, a very explosive situation. Uh, we, we've seen this, of course, very clearly in the case of Evergrande, which has missed payments to creditors, 
has already begun liquidating assets, and it does not look like it will be receiving any kind of a bailout from Beijing, not a substantial one in any case. Real estate, of course, is a, a particularly difficult sector. Not only is it a load-bearing wall of the Chinese economy, it's the store of value for a mass, vast majority of Chinese, uh, ordinary Chinese people, 80% of whom own housing. And, of course, it is the singular source of revenue for most local governments. There is not an alternative uh, ready to hand. The fate of, of, of the, neither of these undertakings, either Xi's or Biden, is foreordained. I happen to think that because Beijing has uh, such a track record of being able to enact its policies very quickly, and because the United States, of course, faces a major election in just a year that could hand its margin, its very thin margins of of majority, the Democratic Party's thin margins in the House and the Senate back to the GOP, we could see that stopped in its tracks. It's, it's a, sort of a frightening prospect. Anyway, um, Lord knows the U US is, uh, is facing a lot of challenges, but you know, China is too. The important question though, to ask though is why now? Why are they undertaking this massive change right now? I would assert that China since 2018 has undergone what you might describe as an involuntary stress test. And it began with the, the trade war. It began with the, the, the mutual slapping of tariffs on each other's goods between the United States and China, in which China seems to have survived well. Then it was followed by, of course, this technology cold war, where the United States seems to have tried to deliberately starve China of important technological inputs. Then, of course, this was all happening against the backdrop of where things in, in Hong Kong were happening, the, the passing of the, this vicious national security law, and, uh, of course, the atrocity that's been going on in, in Xinjiang. And for all of this, uh, this was all happening even before the COVID-19 pandemic really struck. China believes, and not without good reason, that it has emerged from this trial with actually more regime support than it had before it went into it, with more political capital actually banked than it did before. Uh, you know, the Western press talked quite a bit about uh, the death of Li Wenliang, the ophthalmologist who first blew the whistle on the human-to-human -human transmission of COVID-19. And when he died in hospital of COVID, people talked about a Chernobyl moment, which did not actually come to pass. Then China cratered its economy deliver deliberately. It cratered its economy, and it was the only major economy to have seen substantial growth in the year 2020, and it was the only one to have had a genuinely V-shaped recovery. So China feels like it has passed this stress test with flying colors. You know, uh, Meng Wanzhou, who, who Gideon talked about just now, she's back in Shenzhen. They survived that whole ordeal. Huawei and other Chinese tech companies are still alive and well, right? Um, you know, China actually has been able to rally support in the UN, even from Muslim-majority countries. Uh, so the, the, they decided that they can enjoy a lot of long-term gain by enduring some more short-term pain. And so they look at their, their current situation and they have judged that now is the right time to break eggs and make the omelet. Now is the right time to, uh, to do that big remodeling that they need, needed, they've been putting off for years, to pull off the band-aids, whatever metaphor you prefer. Xi Jinping has made up his mind, and the Communist Party has signed off on it. It believes it has now put one chapter of history squarely behind it and is embarking on a new one, in a deliberate transition. It's bound to be a process that is fraught with difficulty, with a more challenging international environment than China has seen in a very long time, really ever since the immediate aftermath of the Tiananmen incident and the massacre of June 4, 1989 in Beijing. China's doors remain largely closed, this is true, but this doesn't mean that international scrutiny has abated. Just in the last week, we saw furor erupt because a star women's tennis player in Beijing had written an allegation about sexual misconduct, about rape, actually, of a, uh, by a former member of the Politburo Standing Committee. Uh, we saw that happen. The gap between the liberal West's social norms on issues like LGBTQ, on things like uh, Me Too, uh, the rights of minority nationalities, that gap looms larger and has become, e you know, even wider, an issue of even greater contention. Pressure on China over the mass extra-legal detention of Uyghurs and other Muslims in Xinjiang will 
be undiminished, even though the, the doors have been closed. Now, we don't need party pronouncements announcing the advent of a new era to know that we are truly at the beginning of one. I mean, if we zoom out and we look at the bigger patterns of China's history, there are good reasons to assert that irrespective of how China seems to want to demarcate things, just objectively, we are experiencing the onset of a new era. To me, at least, this is a thrilling, even dizzying idea. For 180 years, one single question has animated intellectual and political life in China. One question has driven that. And it's, it's been a singular quest, a search for a satisfactory answer to how do we make China rich and powerful, right? I mean, really, ever since the, the mid-century crisis of the Qing Dynasty, ever since the opening salvos of the Opium War, this has been the question that has been on the minds of Chinese intellectuals and politicians. And every ism and every ology, everything from anarcho-syndicalism to pure straight liberalism, everything from Leninism to Marxism to, uh, to humanism, every, every idea that Chinese have offered up, that, that Chinese have fought for and died for, all these have been an effort to answer this singular question. To be a satisfactory answer though, in order for people to have accepted it, it has had to satisfy a condition that the great historian Joseph Levinson, who influenced many, many, many students of China's history, including me, he said that it had to be something that was both recognizably Chinese, something that was mine, something that was consonant with my own feelings and emotions as a Chinese person, and something that was true, objectively true, when you looked without sentimentality at the world around you. In order for it to be both mine and true, it, uh, it, that's the only way for, for it to have worked. And China, for better or for worse, believes that it has found that answer. And it's a strange, unique amalgam that's emerged with features of Confucianism, of legalism, of Leninism, of straight up Marxism, of, of, of liberalism, of neoliberalism, if you like, of technocracy. And it stands in, in quite stark juxtaposition to the approaches em embraced by the other states, which are for the most part liberal, market-driven democracies. So what will be the posture of those democratic states to the West and for the countries of the global South that China will have been the only country to have made it into the exclusive club of developed nations not to have done so under democratic auspices? So as China works out the answer to this next animating question, some tensions are already clear. What is this next question though? The next question is now that China has achieved wealth and power, what kind of a state will it be? What kind of a power will it be in the world? And what's fascinating to me about this question is that one, it's the same question that the rest of the world is asking about China. What kind of power will China be? This is something entirely new. And the second thing is that it is all happening. China's answer will be taking place under the glare of international scrutiny. This is not going to be something easy for, for China to come, uh, come with. The things that China has had to do, imposing linguistic uniformity, assimilating restive minorities, stifling dissent, elevating a strongman ruler, and apparently empowering him for a life term, all these things offend with good reason, contemporary liberal sensibilities in Europe, in North America. And they seem to be relics of a less enlightened past. They strike me very much in the same way, and I know that a great many Chinese people, Chinese elites, feel this way too. They're embarrassed or even ashamed and, and feel that the, the sting of the West's disapproval falls very heavily on them. And yet, I've come to understand that many of these people are now willing to endure that disapproval in the interest of completing the construction of the nation. This project of nation building is taking place, like I said, under this pitiless glare of international scrutiny by nations that have already gone through it. Some of what China is undergoing today might be compared, after all, to what Italy went through in the age of Mazzini and Garibaldi, to what Germany went through in the age of Bismarck to what Switzerland actually underwent a lot earlier in the 14th and the 15th century with the First Confederation. But it's still, you know, a, a, a difficult question for it to answer. It, it's going to be the animating question of, of, of the time. And as we, as we watch it undergo this process, we have to take very seriously 
as has been said before, by Kevin Rudd and by other people this morning, uh, that we have to take seriously what China says, but at the same time, we cannot blithely assume that China will always either do what it says it will or be able to complete what it sets out to complete. We have to assume that it cannot impose on either the world, on the region, or even on itself the vision that its leaders have articulated. We have to remind ourselves constantly that much of what China will do is going to be in reaction to the policies and even to the rhetoric of other countries. We have to develop a sense for how Beijing is likely to react. We have to remember that while China's conversations are taking place often behind closed doors and are opaque, not transparent to us, what we in the West often are doing, we, our discussions, our policymaking, is in a glass house we, they, for the world to see. This means that we are going to have to pick our battles very wisely. We're going to have to rise to meet the important challenges that China will inevitably present and not push back, though, on every single issue where we don't see eye to eye. It will require us to make compromises, to dial down our hubris and our hostility, especially in the case of the United States. We have to remember that China's success in this risky new undertaking would actually be good for us. After all, a slower going, a slower growing, more socially stable and more environmentally responsible China is something we should all be cheering for. Thank you very much. Kaiser. Thanks so much, thanks so much. I have just a couple of questions uh, prepared. Um, um, we had this uh, Biden-Xi meeting November 16. Mm. What, uh, uh, on your perspective, what did you make out of that? Well, I think um, a lot of us who were watching it went in with fairly low expectations. I mean, after, after all, the first few diplomatic rounds, for example, Anchorage, where we had uh, two very senior Chinese diplomats, uh, Yang Jiechi was, was one meeting with uh, Anthony Blinken and, and with, uh, with uh, uh, Jake Sullivan, and that was a disaster. I mean, I think by most accounts, we didn't see that at all. We, we actually saw uh, it, a very well-staged managed uh, meeting. It did not, as we expected, it did not produce any great outcomes. But what I think is really significant, if I had to say one thing about it, it's what wasn't said during the meeting. One thing that, that Biden did not do in any of the readouts, I, didn't see, I, I saw none of this. He did not push China on COVID investigation or on anything related to, to COVID. And that was a, surely a tremendous relief to Beijing. The second thing was that Xi Jinping did not offer an invitation to the Winter Games. If he had done so, it would have placed Biden in a very difficult position politically. Either he would have had to say yes on the spot, which would have brought down the opprobrium of a lot of human rights organizations, like the, the, the nice people that we saw here today, or uh, he would have had to say no, which would have been a real snub and it would have just ruined the atmospherics of, of, the, of the meeting. So what does that mean? If so they it did means not that, do that? Yeah, it means that we're not in a thaw, we are not necessarily in a detente, but we are arresting the, the, the velocity of the descent. And that's, that's a good start. Mm -hmm. um, what I was wondering is um, if you see us discussing here about the two blocks and uh, try to understand China. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I've seen you, you've been here the whole morning. Yeah. So what do you think, first question, is it possible for somebody with this Western background to ever understand China? Absolutely it is. Really? To understand it enough. I think there are a couple of things that I would say. And one is that we need to exercise this capacity for cognitive empathy. Empathy we all have, right? We all are born with this idea. If you tell me that your mother has just passed away, I don't need to know anything about your relationship with her to feel an emotional connection with you. I'm sorry. I, I, will, you know, I, I won't smile and say, oh, that's oh, wonderful. No, yeah. of not. But um, <laughs> if, when, you're, when you're trying to extend empathy to a, 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 somebody with a very different background or even to expand it to a country, a civilization that does not have a historical uh, background that's similar to yours. It didn't experience the same historical forces that you did. An entirely different divorced history for you know, thousands of years that had uh, a, a, an entirely different panoply of heroes and villains 
of mythologies, of fairy tales, of bedtime stories, a totally different culture. It's hard. It requires you to study. It requires you to actually read and to talk to a lot of people. But I do not think that the mental furnishings of the Chinese mind are unknowable to us. I think that we can actually make an approximation of it, deliberately put ourselves into those shoes and look out the view through China's windows, taking into account the lenses that it uses, the, the optical distortions in the Chinese mind, the mental furnishings that populate the Chinese mindset, that, the values, the habits of mind, the, the assumptions about the world. We can do that and we must. We can't just look at things through the single lens of, of national our, security. Uh, okay, or, and, or and our, our, our uh, background, I understand. So if there's one thing. You missed, tell us. No, if there's one thing that you should know, we should keep in mind about China, it's this, that imagine somebody graduating high school in 1979 on the, the, the dawn of reform and opening and taking their first job, that person, when China's per capita GDP was less than $200 a year, is now thinking of retiring when the GDP per capita of China is over $10,000. So this, we're talking about a 5,000% increase in per capita GDP. And that has happened uh, in one working lifetime. In other words, it's been compressed. So this explains an awful lot. It explains, for example, why, I mean, because it's the hardware. We look at the hardware, we look at the high-speed rails, we look at the gleaming forests of steel and glass in Shanghai. We look at the, the incredible tech prowess of Shenzhen, and we think, well, that is a, they should have a mentality that's commensurate with that. But they went to bed last night as a child and woke up in the body of an adult, like Tom Hanks in the movie Big. Does anyone remember that? <laughs> and we cannot imagine uh, what it's like to, to experience these things. That's why the, thin, the, the skin can be so thin, why they take such offense when a, an NBA coach says something about Hong Kong. Or, yeah. and so, I mean, that's why uh, I think yeah. it's, it's important to understand that. But it's all, what it's also important to understand from this compressed experience is that nobody in China over the age of 50 can even remember a time when life did not improve not just year to year, but almost day to day. And this happened in lockstep with technological improvement. So they have more faith than, say, Americans do, that their government is capable of steering them wisely into an uncertain future. They have more faith that technology is actually good for society. You don't see the same kind of fear of technology in China that you see in the United States. It's a very different world. And the third thing that you should take away from, from this the, the thin skin, you know, is that people have a living memory of the chaos of the Cultural Revolution. Hundreds of millions of Chinese people alive today remember poverty, they remember the, the Cultural Revolution even more. Some even remember the Great Leap Forward famine. 40 million people died. So they are, it's a different mentality. Just th these are the things to remember. That is the first step on your way to building genuine cognitive empathy with the Chinese worldview. This is very interesting, thank you. But um, I wonder why, if, if they went up that fast, and this is for the Chinese people such a positive development, um, why is China going to something like self-isolation, like uh, Gideon said, why? Yeah. Or wouldn't you share this, this uh, opinion? I think that we underestimate the extent to which this is really about COVID. I think that, that there, there was, a lot of pressure on China. There's so much pressure not to screw it up right now because, you know, in their heart of hearts, they understand that the first weeks were bad, that China did not do what it needed to do in the first weeks. It understands in its heart of hearts that the, in, the benefits that it enjoys, the, the, uh, the positive attitudes of its population toward it right now rest largely on uh, its handling of COVID. And it, it has committed at this point. There's too much momentum in favor of a zero COVID policy. I believe that this will have to change and it's gonna be disruptive when it, it eventually does change, but they've staked too much on it. So I do not think that this is being done deliberately to keep the prying eyes out okay. of China. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's, it's being done. And one thing that came out of the Biden-Xi conference was that they are going to expedite business visas. 
So we, you know, Americans yeah. and, and Europeans will be able to visit China on business visas without the onerous quarantine. Ah, really? Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, you ask for cognitive empathy, um, but there are many people in the Western countries, they watch China's rise with uneasy feelings. So, I mean, some even talk about being afraid. Is, yeah. there, is there a need to be afraid? And if yes, what about? So I don't think so. No, I, I really don't think so. I think that it, you know, whether or not somebody is afraid, it, uh, what it comes down to is how they size China's ambitions. There are people who believe, and I think without evidence, that China intends to s simply displace the United States and replace it as a global hegemon. I think that people who think that that is the case are wrong. I think that people who think that China has no ambitions outside of its own domestic territory are also wrong. I think that it, what it wants probably is primacy, not total hegemony, but certainly primacy within what's called the second or the first island chain. It wants to be the top dog in East Asia and Southeast Asia and probably not far beyond that. It's still a question of whether, and I don't think the United States has a good track record of doing so, whether it can live with that. Um, so it's, it's, it's going to be difficult. Should we be afraid? I mean, I think it's completely understandable that it would be afraid. I mean, the United States has enjoyed a period of unchallenged hegemony since the end of the Cold War, but even during the Cold War, even in all the years since the Second World War ended, it has never faced a multi-dimensional peer competitor. It's faced peer competitors, Japan, sure, in the 1970s, the Soviet Union, but neither of them was economic and strategic and, uh, and technological, mm -hmm. and the triple threat. Right? Mm -hmm. um, a last question just coming up to my mind is the role of Switzerland, because as I learned, Switzerland has a very special role also in China um, since, since decades. Do you think Switzerland could, uh, maybe I'm a dreamer, but it's never bad to have a dream, um, that uh, Switzerland could have a special role as an intermediary in, in, in those global uh, uh, situation, in this global situation with two blocks? I, I think I'm not qualified to answer that question except in a <laughs> I mean, I might not, I know, I might know the difference between, you know, Gruyere and M. Teller cheese, but. At least, but. at least, that speaks for you. Thank you very much. But, but. Uh, thank you, thank Kaiser. You so much. Thank, thank you, Kaiser. Thank you. Thank you.